Good afternoon and welcome to an amazing ceremony we're going to have today to recognize two future patient safety leaders that have been doing some amazing work. Uh, with me today is Helen Haskell, a close friend, the mother of Lewis Blackman. You'll hear more about the Lewis Blackman Award in the next few minutes. And also Gwen Sherwood, another great friend, patient safety leader, uh, has really driven education, not only in the nursing community, but across the entire world and making healthcare a safer place. It's my honor to introduce and recognize the 20th anniversary of Lewis Blackman's death on November 6, 2000. At that time, the patient safety movement decided to dedicate an award in Lewis's name for outstanding leadership in patient safety by students pursuing a health professions education or by graduate resident physicians still in training. Lewis Blackman was an outstanding student and his mother, Helen, has spent these past 20 years dedicating her life to making healthcare safer for others and leaving a legacy in Lewis's name. And this award is just the next step in creating that legacy around Lewis. His life and his death has had an impact on so many of us and changed the world for a better place in recognizing Lewis and keeping his memory alive. So today, we're gonna to recognize the first two award winners. The first is Oscar San Roman, Orozco, and the second is Nicholas Stark. So I will turn it over to Helen Haskell, who will take us through the awards and presentations to these fine young future healthcare leaders. Thank you, David. Um, Alyssa, could you move the slide back two slides to the picture of Lewis, please? So I can talk a little bit about the award. Um, thank you. So I just wanted to um, take a minute or two before we introduce our two winners to really reflect on some of the history and the meaning behind this award to me personally. Um, as Dave said, I'm Lewis Blackman's mother, um, and he died 20 years ago of failure to rescue in a teaching hospital, which I viewed as an educational failure. And as Dave mentioned, Telluride and QSIN and medical, nursing, allied health, and above all, patient education have really been the heart of nearly everything we've tried to do since then as patient advocates. And this award is certainly is no exception. We've been supported and encouraged in our work by national educators like David Mayer and Gwen Sherwood because they recognized our common mission. And if it weren't for them, I don't think we would be here today. So maybe another time, I'll talk about my observations of the healthcare education system. But today I wanna to talk just briefly about why we've chosen to have an award about education in Lewis's name. As David mentioned, Lewis was an outstanding student, but his education really consisted of more than just being a good student. He, even at his young age, was a person with deep knowledge. And that's really what I'm hoping to honor here today. In a world where facts are at our fingertips, people don't always appreciate the intrinsic value of knowledge. But my husband's and my theory as parents was that you have to have your own knowledge in your own head, not just to be able to act quickly and think quickly, but to be able to fit new facts in and to think critically, to develop a philosophy of life. And a culture of safety is really a philosophy of life. It requires knowledge and education to understand the need for it and how it works and how to contribute to it and help expand it. That's the way we tried to teach Lewis to think. And it's what we're trying to support with these awards. And it's the quality we see in the two young people we're honoring today, Oscar, San Roman Orozco and Nicholas Stark. 
they're the sort of students who will make a difference in the world. And indeed, they already have. So we're pleased and excited to have them as our inaugural Patient Safety Movement Foundation Lewis Blackman Leadership Award awardees. Um, next slide, please, Alyssa. So, um, I just want to give you a little background about Oscar, our first awardee. Oscar's a public health student who's working on his Master's of Public Health at the New York University School of Global Public Health. He has an MD degree already from the Autonomous University of Cuauhtero, Mexico, where he was also president of the Federation of the University Students of Cuauhtero. He's an intern at PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. Oscar was nominated for the Lewis Blackman Award for his leadership in the Bourne Pulse Oximetry Project in the state of Cuauhtero, where he coordinated and validated the use of pulse oximetry tests to check for congenital heart disease in all newborns in the state. Oscar's published this work along with many colleagues and has promoted the expansion of the initiative to five other Mexican states. He's also co-directed the first Latin American symposium on this subject. Historical statistics indicate that nearly one fourth of infant deaths in Mexico are due to congenital heart disease, meaning that this project has the potential to substantially affect child mortality in Mexico. Congratulations, Oscar, and thank you for your good work. Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. And, and, and thank you to all here. I'm very honored. And uh, I just like to say that since I, I, I was little, uh, my parents taught me to, to be grateful. So first, like I just mentioned before, I like to thank all the board that honored me with this award, to my mentors, Dr. Isidro Gutierrez and Anna Marie Sarinen, um, the leader of the Newborn Foundation and, and the main and also to the main influencers of the patient safety culture in Mexico, my friends, Dr. Javier Davila and Dr. Riz Torres. And I also like to thank and, and believe this award should be for all the nurses, physicians, hospital directors and leaders in the, in the nursery areas that believe in the project that I had the honor to implement in, in these states. And, on, on, and that on every birth, they perform the neonatal screening, which is the, the area of the patient safety that I mainly focus. Um, as part of my education as a physician and now as an MPH, I've been taught that we must not act alone, that the, we must connect with ourselves, our souls, minds, heart, and brain, and be mindful of where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, but unfortunately, through time, you forget about it and you just adapt yourself to a healthcare system full of errors with a huge load and, uh, and controlled by people who most of the time just care about the data or what you get from them. I strongly believe that thanks to, to my mother, I didn't fall into this system. She taught me that uh, among many things that everyone deserves to be treated equally, regardless of anything, and that everyone is carrying a heavy load of emotion and pressures and that patients are not your, just numbers or, or diseases. They are just persons and deserve uh, my respect, love, and full attention. So through this path, I've been found that, um, I found, sorry, that the, the, the most amazing human beings in the world are mothers. And this is why I'd like to, to congratulate you, uh, Helen, uh, that you've made this, this work and your commitment. And, I, I, I love a quote from the, in the Zulu culture that, that, that uh, the phrase that a person is a person through the other people. And they use this term, the Ubuntu term for this. And this idea of community as a, as a building block of society is what defines, I think, the culture of patient safety. Here in, in Mexico, leaders like, like the ones I mentioned and their teams since 2016 in, in the Academy of Surgery, the Hospital Español, and the different ministries of health involved uh, have brought to the light the need of being mindful and, and prepared for every procedure performed. And the road is long, uh, it's not going to be easy, but thanks to the generosity and commitment of uh, Mr. Kiani, David Mayer, Mike Durkin, the, the, the ride is going smooth. And um, thank you again, Ms. Helen, 
uh, thanks to all of the board that, uh, like you mentioned, if we want, you're teaching us that if we want to, to see a change in the world, we must be part of it. And thanks for believing in young people and um, thanks for inspiring and being part of, of, of the change. Thank you, Oscar. Um, can you hold up the trophy so that we can see it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, very good. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, and congratulations. Now we Thank will turn much. to our next winner, Nicholas Stark. Um, and Nick is a familiar face to some of us today from his participation in the Telluride Patient Safety Summer Camp when he was a medical student at the Georgetown University in Washington. Nick is now an emergency medicine resident at the University of California in San Francisco, where he's been on the front lines battling COVID. At UCSF, Nick's led a team to create a digital communication, to, communication tool to help systematize the rapidly changing flow of COVID-related information and to provide accessible up-to-date information directly to the front lines in the emergency department. His tool has been published and is now a model for other institutions. Nick is also actively involved in a number of other patient safety and quality initiatives at his hospital and elsewhere. He's the resident representative to the American College of Emergency Physicians, ASEP, Quality and Patient Safety Committee, and he is part of a national emergency medicine qualitative study aimed at better understanding crisis response and improving safety culture and communication during critical resuscitation during COVID-19. Congratulations, Nick, and thank you for everything you are doing. Nick? Thank you, Helen. I'm very honored to be here. It's Definitely been a, a difficult year um, within healthcare and I'm continually amazed by the, de the dedication and work of, of so many. Um, and I think this year for me has really highlighted the importance of making, making care safer. So in our, in our emergency department um, with, with the COVID pandemic, we've restricted a lot of visitor access to try to keep, keep patients and, and family members safe, but that, that comes with its own challenges. Um, in a lot of situations, those, those family members are those patients' best advocates. And, and there's a definite gap um, that, that we're experiencing in, in patient care with, with not being able to have as many family members present as part of their care at, at all points during their hospital stays. And, and that's what we've tried to do with, with that tool here in San Francisco. Um, is really empowering clinicians with the most up-to-date information, um, both for our local hospital, as well as um, the most accurate information we have on, on up to a global scale. Um, and Helen, personally, I would like to thank you for really sparking my interest in, in patient safety and in this, in this movement. I remember very specifically hearing you share Lewis's story um, early on in, in medical school, and that inspired me to get involved in our, our hospital's Patient and Family Advisory Council for Quality and Safety, and then attend the, the Telluride um, Conference as well. And that has really, really inspired me and helped me move along this path of trying to, to be an advocate for patients and, and for families. And I've been really grateful to, to bring that, that energy and interest here out to, out to San Francisco as well. I've had some wonderful mentors out here, um, Top Peabody, Malini Singh, as well as uh, folks leading the patient safety movement nationally and globally, like like Dave Mayer on the call. Um, so, so thank you all for for all the work you're already doing, and thank you for helping helping inspire the next next generation of of clinicians and um, professionals working toward toward making patient care safer. Thank you, Nick. Um, I guess I should ask you also to hold up your award um, so that there we are. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just so impressed at the work that both of you are doing, and I'm so proud that um, to have you for our first Lewis Blackman um, honorees at Patient Safety Movement. 
Um, so I hope you can all join me in congratulating um, Nick and Oscar. And I will turn it over to David. Yes, we all clap. And I will turn it over to David, who's going to tell us a little bit about the background um, of patient safety education that he's been involved with in, over all these years. David? Well, thank you, Helen, and I want to also congratulate Oscar and Nick, uh, truly outstanding young leaders who are going to make a difference and continue to save lives. Um, along with those beautiful plaques they received, each of them will get a $250 gift that goes along to help support them in their efforts and and show our appreciation at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for all you're doing. When we created this award about five, six months ago and the idea and discussed it with Helen, Helen shared that we should have some sort of webinar, little educational forum each year tied to this award ceremony. And I was honored when she asked if I'd be the first speaker at uh, these annual award ceremonies. So I'm going to kick us off with a very short overview of some of the things going on in patient safety education and then turn it over to Gwen Sherwood who will share the great, great work being done by Cusin and Gwen. And uh, finally then Helen will lead us in a little bit on a panel discussion about the current state of patient safety education in the healthcare environment. So uh, I will now share my screen so people could see as I walk us through a little overview of, of where we are in my mind and some of the successes we've seen. So hopefully everybody sees um, my screen. I, I've learned through the years that when we have no roadmap, let's look to other industries Let's look to other high risk organizations and define and learn what they did to change their culture to one of high quality safe care. And, and I love this. When I started reading uh, crew resource management books and what aviation has done, and these were two experts in the field of aviation safety and crew resource management. They shared at an Institute of Medicine panel many years ago, they said experience gained in other safety critical industries has shown that if healthcare is truly to change its culture to one of safety and optimal quality and care outcomes, education and experience and application should be introduced early in healthcare training, specifically at the student level as this is the period of acculturation into the profession. Medical schools must invest in curriculum development to address these safety issues at the earliest stages of training. And this was Robert Helmreich and David Mewson. And David Mewson was a physician pilot, so he got both sides of it. And it's not only medical education and medical schools, it's nursing schools, it's public health, it's pharmacy schools. And so our motto as we started looking at this many years ago is how do we bring the learning up earlier as opposed to my generation who had to learn at the point of care when we had already gone 10, 15, 20 years into our curriculum. So what are the three things that you know I was looking at that wanted to highlight? First, after a number of years, the ACGME, the Accreditation for Medical uh, Residency um, Programs, has really taken a leadership step and put together what they call the Clinical Learning Environment Review. And similar to what ACGME or Joint Commission does when they do site visits, is they come to an institution, they come to an academic health system, and they go through exactly what that program is doing to try to bring quality and safety education into the curriculum. Things like, are the residents learning how to report? Do they know where to report when they see a near miss or unsafe condition? Once they've reported, are they active in regards to how a review is done, an event review or a root cause analysis around that event? And then are they also active in the improvement process? How do you change the system and, and fix the gaps that were identified from that root cause analysis? They also get into 
disclosure, transparency, and how to communicate to patients and families after a preventable medical harm event. So the ACGME is, is doing some really good stuff and they're slowly going to start rolling this into the accreditation process for residency programs. The IHI Open School has been a leader for many years in creating online curricula that focus on specific areas within quality and safety and, and numerous nursing students, medical students, pharmacy students, and resident physicians have gone through their modules, taken their programs, and it's really made a, a big difference in setting the foundation for these young future leaders and understanding the importance of quality and safety. And then I'm gonna let Gwen spend her time on QSIN. What a great quality and safety education program on nursing. They clearly were leaders, in my belief, long before medical schools or other schools jumped on board with these type of activities. Something that you've heard mentioned a couple of times that I'm very proud of, and Helen and Gwen have been faculty, uh, we started these, what are referred to as Telluride Roundtables. 16 years ago, back in 2005, we held our first one, where we brought 20 health science students out together and spent four days in Colorado. They got to meet people like Helen and Gwen Sherwood and Lucian Leap and Cliff Hughes from Australia. We brought all these great leaders together, and we spent four days just deep dives. We started eight in the morning and we went well into the evening, continuing discussions on how to make healthcare safer. And these young leaders just took what we, um, what they absorbed and went out and started changing the world. We've now had over 1,200 students and residents go through our programs, the Telluride alums as we refer to them. And we're gonna continue to do that this summer as long as it looks like we could do it safely with four weeks of training going on in Colorado this summer. So we're excited to get back into the mix of things. Different domains, we're finally starting to teach about high reliability and patient safety, the idea of resilient science and how do we learn from other organizations that have safety issues, that have shown that even though their environment is a high risk environment like aviation and nuclear energy, we can learn things from them and we're applying them. So the ability to make sure young learners know about these tools, techniques, behaviors, and attitudes that are so critical to achieving a culture of safety. We have to look at human factors and we spend a lot of time in our Telluride sessions going over the importance of human factors and changing systems and processes. James Reasons, the father of safety, said, we cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. That was the name of the IOM report. It was to err as human. If we make an error like they do in aviation, how, have, how do they trap that error and keep it from going forward? We need to apply human factor science around what we do. And I said this many years ago, and now I've seen it appear in quotes and and other things um, across social media, but we have to engage patients and families. They have to be at the table. I always said, if we think we're gonna solve this patient safety crisis without having patients and family members around the table, we're fooling ourselves. They see things, they bring different perspectives, and I've learned probably more from patients and families of how to make care safer than I have from many of my colleagues through the world. And you heard Nick talk about the Patient and Family Advisory Council for Quality and Safety and his involvement. So important if we are going to get to zero preventable harm. We have to also embrace transparency and it's a key theme of trying to educate the next generation, not only around outcomes. If we don't talk about our outcomes and share it, we'll never improve, but also communication after medical harm has occurred, preventable medical harm. If we're not willing to share it and learn from it, we continue to make the same mistakes over and over. And as Lucian Leap said, the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. I will tell you, every time my phone would ring, somebody calling to tell me about a preventable harm event or a safety event that occurred at the site that was going on right now, 
I start hearing the details, sometimes the first thing that went through my mind was, how did that happen? How could that person have made that decision? But once we got the information together, once we talked to the team, I realized I probably would have made the same decision that person made at the time with the information we provided them to make that decision. We have to protect our caregivers at the front line, make the environment safe for them so they could optimize and provide the safest care possible for the patients that they come to work to heal every day. And I love this quote in aviation, it's more important to identify the hazards and threats to safety than to identify and punish an individual for a mistake. We exchange the ability to reprimand an individual for the ability to gain greater knowledge. And Jeff Skiles was the first officer sitting next to Sully Sullivan in the uh, Miracle on the Hudson aircraft. I love that quote. You know, it's not about reprimanding. It's not about finding blame and shame. It's about learning and improving and saving future lives. And finally, I'll close with a book that changed my life dramatically. It's called Wall of Silence, written by Rosemary Gibson and uh, her husband. It's an amazing book that talks about the lives of 75 patients or families that were changed due to preventable medical harm. And it's not about why the event happened. It's not about the root causes or trying to solve the problems. It was what did patients and families want after our care didn't live up to our standards, after we unfortunately harmed somebody while trying to do well. And Rosemary highlighted there were four things that research and science has proven through the years since this book came out. The first is patients want honesty. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't hide the facts. Answer my questions in an open and honest way. Second, when appropriate, they want an apology. If our care was substandard, we need to apologize. Third, they wanted resolution. Sometimes that was just the apology and knowing that what happened wasn't their fault. Other times those resolutions involve monetary support for the family or the patient because of the harm that happened. And finally, in every case I've ever been involved with, the family wanted to know, what are you gonna to do to change the environment so somebody doesn't suffer the same harm or death that our loved one did? Show us you learned and improved. And Rosemary was so right, and I encourage everybody to read her book. And I'll stop there. And uh, I will introduce Gwen Sherwood to take us through the next part of our panel discussion and share her thoughts about CUSIN. We can't hear you, Gwen. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dave, and let me first uh, uh, offer my congratulations to Nicholas and Oscar and recognize the outstanding work that you have already done in your careers and hoping that um, you will continue this trajectory and that we will look back and say, we knew you when. Uh, we really are, are so proud of the work that you are doing. It was my pleasure in 2005 to join with um, Dr. Linda Cronenwet in submitting of what became a series of grants to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that launched the Quality and Safety Education for Nursing. Uh, we abbreviate that to CUSIN as the um, abbreviation. And so uh, we have, um, uh, through the generosity of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we were able to take the six competencies from the Institute of Medicine, which are patient-centered care, teamwork and collaboration, evidence-based practice, quality improvement, safety and informatics. We define those uh, with 162 knowledge statements that we were able to, over the series of years, get those incorporated into all standards of nursing curriculum. So all nursing education programs are accountable to their accrediting agencies for including quality and safety in their curriculum. 
And while we're really proud of that, we know that there's still quite a lot of variability into the depth and range of that education. So the work is not done. But we do know that we're graduating new generations of nurses who are going to work in clinical agencies and asking in their interview questions, so what safety projects do you have ongoing in your facility? And they are choosing to go to work in places that are known for providing quality of care and for really looking into patient safety. Now we are more and more uh, focusing on how we make sure that all nurses, not just new graduates, but all nurses are able to practice within safety culture environments. And many institutions are embedding the QC competencies into their professional practice models that guide nursing practice and guide the work that nurses do on the front lines. We have many stories of accomplishments of nurses through the last year in COVID and how they have been able to continue to live by these competencies, by these values that are instilled from patient safety. Yet we know that many aspects of patient safety did suffer in the time of COVID. And it's interesting that Dave uh, very eloquently stated how important patients are, patients and their families are to patient safety. And that really was uh, very clear in the time of COVID because um, patients were not allowed to have visitors. And we found out that families really do help to keep patients safe. And it's that um, team that's created between the healthcare provider and the family member that really is vital in keeping patients safe, preventing falls, uh, making sure that there are correct medications, uh, making sure patients uh, know when they're supposed to be someplace. So um, it's that teamwork that is so important that is such a big part of how we are learning and moving and growing and advancing the safety um, culture agenda. Uh, and the thing that is also very encouraging is the global work. And I'm really excited that one of the winners today was from Mexico. I used to do a lot of work in Northern Mexico. And so I'm aware of some of the uh, challenges that you might have uh, encountered in implementing the work that you did. But the work is, is uh, becoming global the quality and safety book is translated into four languages. Uh, we have a lot of schools around the world who are embedding the competencies into their education programs. And I believe that it is as we collaborate country to country, school to school, program to program, and through organizations like the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, that we are going to hopefully as um, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation envisions reach zero, because any number above zero is too many, because that might be your mother, your brother, your aunt, your uncle. And so it is the thing for us is to do the right thing for every patient, every time, every day. And with uh, clinicians like Nicholas and Oscar, we're going to be able to accomplish that. Thank you. That's wonderful, Gwen. Thank you. Um, that both to thank you to both of our, our speakers and to our um, our student speakers who also um, really had a lot of sort of thought provoking um, things to say. So I would like to invite all four of our speakers to join me on a panel. Um, which basically is a panel on healthcare education. I want to get your ideas. Um, and I, I, I'll start with Nick and Oscar. I mean, you've both been in the healthcare system for several years now. So you've had sort of a um, worm's eye view, so to speak, of patient safety education. What do you think the present status is of patient safety education? Um, how well do you think it's being done? Um, uh, so I'll start with Nick and then go to Oscar. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great and very important question. And I, I think the fact that we're having these conversations and that 
even the implementation of this award in large part to everything that that you and Gwen and Dave have been doing for years, um, we're making a lot of strides. There's a lot of momentum in large part due to the foundation you all are building and have built. Um, but I, I think we definitely still have, have progress to make. Um, for me, like I mentioned earlier, a, a big part of my journey and the, the, really the start of my journey was having exposure to two stories to make this personal. So hearing, hearing you tell Lewis's story at our med school orientation, um, hearing Rosemary Gibson tell her story, those are really, really powerful tools in encouraging students to get involved in this movement. Um, I think we have a lot of progress to make with incorporating this more into medical education. And, and that really involves both within medical school, nursing school and beyond Kind of changing the culture of, of healthcare and medicine and realizing that both we as humans as well as the systems that that we work in are imperfect and they fail and i think coming coming into this early on i i realized that there a lot of times is this pressure to to maintain that the the system doesn't mess up that um, we have years and often decades of experience that are somehow supposed to override the extraordinary amount of um, pressure that we put on ourselves. And, and so I think these, the system is starting to change, but really recognizing that we have, that our, our systems are imperfect and that, that we're all human um, and using that as a foundation to embrace things like transparency, reporting adverse events, um, that that's really the next step in making in making care safer and incorporating that that further into into the culture of medicine on the whole. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, interesting, your um, emphasis on transparency. I like that. Um, Oscar, I'm not seeing your picture, but I know you're there. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, well. I think from my perspective, I, I would like to say like two, two aspects. First, like in med school, I believe is there. The, the patient safety education in, in med school is taught, is mentioned, pasted and reminded in, in different flyers along the hospital, but there's a lack of engagement because the, the necessary tools to engage are, are, are not there. Sometimes your, your professors, even think that you, for example, you have the necessary communications skills to 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 interact with your patients, but sometimes you're not even you don't even have a course or a class around communication, and also the the, the risk perception among some students who they don't feel like they're fully responsible of the patient since they are learning and and they do not engage fully with this, or they don't or, or they see it like too far. Uh, if I could say that they could make these mistakes with a bit of optimism bias. And from the MPH uh, part that I've been, uh, well, that I'm engaged now in, in some classes uh, about health programs is not continuously reminder either and uh, neither engage. It's, it's, it's something that sometimes is just take it for granted. And um, it's like, you'll take care of the beneficiaries of your interventions or whatever you, you are doing that. But you also need to put them in the table, to put them in, the, in this um, decision table. And I love to, to listen to the word system a lot because through these system thinking exercises and classes and, and lessons is how we, um, I've had great professors that keep telling me that we need to see these little aspects inside the, the, the system. So. And, but I see this as in every deficiency and every lack of problem in a system as, a, as an opportunity. So uh, I see this culture as a seed and as a natural process, uh, as all natural processes of seeds, we are looking at how it grows, how it's spreading among schools of medicines, public health, social work. And like I mentioned, this kind of education needs engagement and yeah. So the impression that I have, um, mainly from our students at Telluride, is that patient safety is, um, you know, is, is not really a, a topic in itself. 
that it, as you're saying, there's a lack of engagement, but there's also a sort of lack of, of perception that it's a real problem, that this is something that even needs to be engaged. And, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but I'm wondering what would engage students and how, what is the best way to, to teach patient safety and to raise awareness of, of the concerns that they should have? Um, do either of you have thoughts about that? Sure, I can speak to that briefly. I think, um, Helen, that's a, a really good point. And it, engaging students is, is something that's really challenging. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, because the, the people we're thinking about are health profession students. So they're kind of already kind of buried in coursework and classes and overwhelmed as it is. Um, so the thing, the thing that really struck a chord for me and has, has impacted a lot, of, a lot of the residents I'm working with and thinking back to medical school, a lot of my um, co-medical students are, are experiences and stories. So for example, having, having someone like you um, speak at an orientation and really setting, setting the foundation early that, hey, this is, this is something that's important here is a way in which it's important. Here's a way it's affected someone's life. Um, and this is gonna be a conversation we're gonna be having over, over the next four or however many years. Um, it, so from this kind of grassroots movement of, of getting students involved and interested, I think those personal stories are, are really powerful and really important. And also things like the Telluride patient safety experience. Those, those experiences spark an interest and a momentum that that goes well beyond the the students that are involved in the actual experience itself. Um, those students go back and start clubs or organizations. They get involved in their patient family advisory councils, um, QI initiatives, and so I think it it really does start this cascade effect. Um, but then also thinking from from the top down, the other end of of the scale, how do we continue to engage? national organizations like the ACGME um, to really prioritize this and, and encourage institutions and universities to, to make patient safety and communication and transparency a, a priority in, in education. Does anybody else have anything to add? Um, Oscar, I, I, you already addressed this a little bit. I don't know if you have more that you want to say. Yeah, I would just add that through very specific and targeted, maybe like community engagement strategies to that push a complete change of behavior and in a, a complete structural change. Community, and, and by community, I mean the hospital leaders the students, the nurses, and the patients, and, 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 the, and the families, and each one of the members in the system. So like the, the, um, the, the education, the patient safety education must not just be targeted to the, the, the students, but also to the leaders. Because for example, here in, 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 in Mexico, um, the workload is huge in hospitals. The interns can, can work even for like 36 hours a shift. And the higher level residents, because they're like in top, uh, yeah, the higher level and base physicians are, are not very like empathic with this, with this situation and they leave all the work to them. And because they are learning, learning. and uh, the mistake here is with the, with the burnout are very feasible. And, and so there, there is something bl uh, making the, the, the hospital leaders blind about that situation. And they are the ones who also need to be educated in this part. They are the ones who must act on behalf of the patients and, and their staff with this workload. Uh, just to mention one, one thing that I see, that I've seen here. And, and, and yeah, just the student residents need to know that indeed their patient is their responsibility, but they're not superheroes because sometimes it's like, I'm the intern, I need to to keep this work because at some point I'm going to be 
the, the leader, the, the high level, and then I want to pass the, do this to the lower level uh, physicians. And it's not, let's break that change. Let completely uh, get rid of, of, of that um, like pyramidal system in which um, the workload is just for the ones in the lower part of the chain. Uh, let's all get engaged and, and be treat, show some empathy to them, uh, be the change and, and, and with love, mindfulness and all these uh, teachings that and all the core values that the, the patient safety education has um, begin in, in a complete, well, sorry, translate them in a complete uh, structural uh, change, I would say. Wow, that's terrific, Oscar. Um, I think that um, that sort of hits the nail on the head. Um, you need a culture change. Uh, so I'm wondering, Gwen and David, if you have anything to chime in on that. I, I really appreciated Nicholas uh, talking about the use of stories and cases, because I really think that is one of the ways that we have found within education to really change the paradigm is um, by really seeing the face of medical error and to really see that this 265,000 represents individuals, family members, neighbors, friends, that they're real people. And so the more that we can personify um, to really make it real, I think that is um, the ways that education can begin to change. And then uh, um, Oscar really echoed that in talking about culture change, because we do have to have a culture change in education, and we have to have a culture change in our practice settings. I, I do see some lots of evidence of that happening, but we, we've got to make that the norm and, and not the exceptional hospitals, the exceptional places, but make that every healthcare facility, inpatient, outpatient, um, uh, uh, and community uh, clinics. So I, I felt like Oscar and Nicholas really gave some uh, good insight onto what we need to be doing. You know, I'll, I'll just add you know, great comments by um, all three people. I always believe in, in the carrot and the stick model. I think the carrot has been things like QCIN in that program. The Patient Safety Movement Foundation has an excellent curricular actionable patient safety solution that was put together by health science deans and educators from around the world. And that's free for health science schools and residency programs to use different components of it. The Telluride program that we've talked about is another example of a carrot you find those young, passionate leaders who, who start understanding or want to learn about safety, and then you really give them the tools, and, and we've seen great things happen. You know, just the idea of, I remember one medical student going back, and we talked about high reliability organizations always starting each meeting with a safety moment, and here's a third-year student amongst all her faculty who was asked to present a case that was admitted during the night and that she worked up and now had to present at morning rounds, but she stopped before her presentation and goes, I'd like to start with a safety moment before we get into the case. And everybody, the faculty are, what's a safety moment? What are you doing? And she explained what a safety moment was and why it was important. And that program started then to use safety moments before morning report each day to remind them just 60 seconds why safety was so important. So the carrot is one thing, the stick is the other. I remember a wise person telling me when I was a academic dean at the University of Illinois that assessment drives the curriculum. If you don't get students to appreciate that the exams will be testing quality safety education, we're gonna to continue to struggle. Now the national boards has finally started writing and testing and implementing some questions on safety, but we need more of that. So students at the young age understand that safety is a science, just like histology and anatomy and other things that are important for us to learn. 
And then ACGME, as you know, Helen, you were on the committee, as am I now, for the Clear Advisory Board. They are moving to make those types of initiatives required for certification of these residency programs. So they will need to show that they are teaching, training the next generation about quality and safety tools, techniques, behaviors, and expectations. So I, I see like when more optimism, but we still got to raise the urgency and, and I'm hoping lectures and awards like this will be another example of, of ways we can elevate that um, to the level it needs to be at. So I have a question. You all have, and this, um, this is a question that just occurred to me from listening to you all. What about COVID? How has the culture changed during COVID? How has safety changed during COVID? Uh, we can't necessarily assume that that sort of situation is gonna be uh, a thing of the past. So how, how has patient safety been affected and patient safety education by COVID and how, how can you move forward? I mean, when you're talking about Oscar, about um, people being so overburdened with work, it's got to be infinitely worse now than it was. Yeah, definitely. I, I would even quote uh, something that they say, like, God always forgives, humans sometimes forgive, but nature never forget, forgives. So the, when, you, when the system is lacking of this culture, when the system is, when the nature of, of, of this system is there without, uh, with all these holes, a pandemic like COVID just evident, like puts in the spot, in the spot, like all, all of this. So it, it, it has given a lot of teaching, I, I would say. Here, I, I haven't been in, in a lot of, of hospitals uh, lately due to my, my career there, but what I've heard from, from fellow students is like, we never thought that it could open our eyes so much. So I would give this um, point to how nature is teaching us that if we don't look for all the small details, they will, uh, they will cost lives at the end. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I think it also has been disruptive of, of healthcare professional education in ways that are really not clear to those of us who are not experiencing it right now. But um, maybe that is a question for another time. I, I, um, I don't know, Gwen or David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I will say nursing education was definitely disrupted by COVID in that many clinical agencies would not allow students uh, in the early months of COVID because it was too new, it was too stressful, uh, no one quite knew what the risk. But then in the aftermath, uh, in the latter part of the year, students were allowed back into clinical. And what has been very interesting is the creativity amongst nursing faculty. And I hear the same, I'm, I'm talking about nursing, but I'm hearing the same thing from medical school faculty, pharmacy faculty, you know, across the health professions began to get very creative. And they've created uh, at the University of North Carolina, they have um, service core teams uh, with um, students and especially recruiting among the health profession students who are the ones who are doing the testing on campus. They are now running, helping run the vaccine clinics. And so it's opened up some new opportunities. So uh, while it has been very challenging, very stressful, and nobody knows the full outcome, um, I have been hearing that um, passing rates on the nursing licensing exam has not dipped in, the, um, in this COVID time. Uh, and I, I really think it's because of the resilience of nursing faculty and of students that they are taking advantage of different learning opportunities and in ways that we never dreamed. I do know it will have a long-term impact in the stress it has created. And I think now we have to really look at caring for the caregiver and how we're going to help people to um, 
restore and renew after, uh, and, and I'm saying after, we're not through it yet, but we need to be turning attention to how we're going to help people renew from this very stressful time. And, and Helen, I'll just take on to what Gwen was finishing with, which I think will really determine how we come out of this pandemic from a, a safety standpoint. There were issues with healthcare safety long before the pandemic. Uh, the workforce, higher burnout rates, higher depression rates, higher suicide rates, things like needle sticks, falls, lifting inju injuries, and the escalating workplace violence injury rates were alarming before the pandemic. And now with the pandemic, I think the public has gotten a, a much better perspective of being a healthcare worker at the front line is a risky career and occupation, not only because of COVID and the numbers that we've lost. I mean, I see numbers of three, four, five thousand caregivers who've been lost during this pandemic uh, for potentially preventable reasons, and the others who have suffered. So, just like the World Health Organization did last year, and we did at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And the Lucian Leap Institute did many years ago under the leadership of the late Paul O'Neill, we had to bring back joy and meeting in the workplace. And if we didn't solve caregiver safety, we'll never solve patient safety. And I think they come together and hopefully that will be a call to arms for all of us coming out of this pandemic is that we gotta make the workforce safer in the jobs they do so they can optimally provide the safest, highest quality care for those they come to heal every day. Thank you, David. I, I think that's, that's such an important point. And I always say that if you don't have patient safety, you don't have worker safety. You have a, 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 it's, you have a safe culture. If you have a safe culture, you have safe patients and then you have safe workers. Um, and, uh, you know, along those lines, Dave, I wanted to ask you about the, the concept of professionalism. So, I, I mean, I see this as a sense of identity, and obligation to society and to, to colleagues that comes with any profession. Um, I've, I've watched the concept of professionalism really change over my lifetime throughout all the professions. And, I'm just wondering, I think it has a lot to do with how professionalism is taught. And I think that professionalism, the idea of safety is a huge component of professionalism. I'm wondering how you see them as interrelating and how you see them as being effectively taught. It's, it's a great question, Helen. And Look, for years, we've tried to have lectures around professionalism and humanism and empathy. And I'm not sure if those topics resonated. I, I think professionalism is defined by role modeling. Some of the best students who've gone on, two of them right here on the panel, have seen and adopted right, the right role models that embrace a professional culture. I think we've got away from that in the 80s and 90s with reimbursement issues. It was more important to, and it still is today, to do volume and productivity versus quality and safety. And that tarnishes a lot of the professional mindsets. I've always said, I, it's rare that I've met a healthcare worker who wasn't going to work to try to do the best job they could. They went into the profession because they believed they could make a difference and contribute to the life of a patient and their family. And yet during those times of bad role modeling and challenges and different incentive models that don't encourage sometimes doing always the right thing for the patient and the family, they get and they get confused. I mean, how many times have you, Gwen and I, heard, heard students who come to Telluride, the number of them who come out there and say, I'm leaving the profession as soon as I finish school. This wasn't what I signed up for. 
and then they hear stories of all of us and, and why we do what we do, and they get reinvigorated again, they get recharged again, and they, they go on and do great things. But yeah, we, we deep down, unfortunately, a lot of the young healthcare givers and, um, and they're tarnished for a long time. So I don't know, it's a roundabout way to your question, Helen, but I think it's one of the biggest challenges and it all comes into creating that culture of safety with proper role modeling. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and Gwen, along those lines, what do you think about um, interprofessional training? I mean, I know that that's, that's a huge thing for nurses and it's been a big thing for you. Um, and yet it still seems to be a rarity. And I realize there are a lot of obstacles. Could you talk a little bit about that, about how you think it's going and, um, and what you think is needed? Yes, it's really been interesting across my career. We've had a number of different terms and Dave will resonate with this. It's been uh, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and uh, it's been connected to through, we were going to achieve this through primary care and so on. And ironically, it has been the patient safety movement that I think has really pushed the interprofessional uh, um, um, role in education because um, interprofessionalism is just uh, interprofessional education is just essential as a part of patient safety education because to um, achieve patient safety culture you really have to learn how to work across the different disciplines you have to learn how to work as a team and you can't just graduate students and put them into the hospital and expect them to know how to communicate because every profession, every discipline has a completely different way of educating. And so trying to think about how we can, um, and the, the definition of interprofessional education is when two or more disciplines learn from, with, and about each other. And so there is content, there are skills, there are domains that we need to make sure are in all of the uh, curricula. Since 2011, um, six of the major professions have had a commitment and now it's up to 16 different disciplines in the US have agreed on the uh, role, uh, the uh, competency domains with the overarching interprofessional collaboration and then roles and responsibilities, ethics and values, communication and teamwork as um, essential to be an accredited uh, health profession school, whether you're nursing, medicine, physician, uh, um, pharmacy and um, physical therapy and so on. And so it is absolutely essential uh, that we have this within the curriculum and we have crosswalked the competencies expected for interprofessional and those expected for safety, and they mesh very, very well. It's the same challenge that we have with safety. It's educating the faculty, the practitioners uh, who are already in the workforce, uh, but our new generations are coming and I, I love how Telluride mixes nursing and medicine. And we dream of the day that we could expand and have more professions there, but you know, funding issues uh, uh, limit what we can do. But um, the interprofessional education and practice, it's not just educating, it's learning to practice and work together, is really an essential part of the patient safety agenda. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. That's great. Um, yeah, that's really important. And it's always, um, yeah. It always seems so difficult to do. So I have one more question. We just got a few minutes left, but um, so, and this really relates back to the idea of professionalism. The core principles of, of communication and compassion and respect are what patients see as really among the most important attributes of healthcare professionals. And they also often feel that that these elements really of kindness are lacking in the healthcare system. So how well do we do at teaching these skills 
And are they all even things that can be taught? Um, are we getting maybe some of the wrong people going into healthcare? Uh, these are big questions. And I guess, Gwen, I will throw that one back to you. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm actually very glad that you did because I've spent a lot of my career studying this very principle in nursing around caring and how we teach compassion. And we talk about if you have compassion without competence, you are being inhumane. But then if you have competence without compassion, you're doing a disservice to your patient. So it's really, you have to have compassion and confidence working together. Uh, there has been um, an unfortunate failure on the part of a lot of the health professions because we are so pressed for content. And um, healthcare is so complex and so it's, really difficult to make curriculum decisions about what you're going to include. But I happen to be on a PhD committee right now that is looking at that very thing. And uh, how can we get that back into the explicit ways that we teach? And so we're looking at how you can embed this into simulations about how you treat patients and each other. It's not just patients, but it's each other with respect and with compassion and uh, with caring. And I think that that is an essential part. And, and, and there are a number of research studies. Brian Sexton's team is one of those that's really looking at that um, there is a direct correlation between work environment and how we treat each other and the quality of care that is happening. So we really do have to focus on that. Terrific. Well Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. I think we've reached the end of our time and I'm going to hand it back over to David um, to, to close us out. Thank you all so much for, for everything that you do, for coming to our ceremony and for being our Lewis Blackman Leadership Award winners. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Helen, for leading a great panel discussion. And uh, in, in closing, I, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Clearly wanted to thank, you know, Oscar and Nick for doing the great work they're doing and congratulate them again. And, um, and Helen, thank you for allowing us to create this annual lecture and award series. Um, you know, I known you for years. I never got to know Lewis, but I feel like he's part of family. So we're excited and thank you for making it happen. It's uh, really, we're gonna make this a great ceremony going forth and we're gonna make sure that no one forgets names like Lewis Blackman and all the others that we've lost until we finally solve this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very, thank thank you very much. You.